A modern computer executes billions of operations every second. For us to successfully program these computers, we need the computer to perform precisely the right operations in the right order. So to have any chance at this incredibly complex task, we need tools for managing this complexity. Let's start with an example. One of the motivations for some of the earliest computer designs was to build a device that could calculate logarithms. So let's write a program that prints out a table of logarithms base 2. This code is written in a programming language called OCaml, but for now, don't worry about the language itself or the details of its syntax. You could imagine writing similar code in other programming languages too. What you should notice is that this code is hopelessly written. It's lengthy, difficult to maintain, and prone to human error. In particular, it misses something important. This code treats each line of the logarithm table as its own individual, without considering their underlying uniformity. What we should realize is that each of these lines is an instance of an underlying pattern like this one. Each line, we print out a decimal number, call it x, the logarithm of x to four decimal places, and a new line. This is abstraction the process of viewing a set of apparently dissimilar things as instantiating an underlying identity. Different styles of programming give us different mechanisms for using these abstractions, ultimately giving us a means for dealing with the complexity of computer programming. A popular programming paradigm is imperative programming, which makes use of the state variable and the loop as its basic abstraction mechanisms. In the case of our program for printing logarithm tables, we could now rewrite the code using these abstraction mechanisms. We have a state variable to let us calculate logarithms for different numbers, and a loop specifying the values that the variable should take on. Imperative programming isn't the only programming paradigm, though. Another important paradigm is that of functional programming, where instead of the state variable or the loop, the key abstraction mechanism is the function, a mapping from inputs to outputs. To explore the differences between imperative and functional programming, let's take a look at an example. Imagine we have a rectangular floor of size 28 units by 20 units, and we'd like to tile the floor with square tiles. One option would be to tile the floor with two by two tiles, which would work because both 28 and 20 are evenly divisible by two. But if we tried to tile the floor with three by three tiles, it wouldn't work. Neither 28 nor 20 are divisible by three, so we'd be left with some extra untiled space on the floor that we couldn't fill. If we wanted to use the fewest number of identical square tiles to tile this floor, then what we want to know is the largest number that divides both dimensions of the floor evenly, otherwise known as their greatest common divisor. So how could we calculate the greatest common divisor? Well, the largest possible value for the greatest common divisor is the smaller of the two dimensions. We know the tiles couldn't be any larger than that, or else they wouldn't fit on the floor at all. So we could start by guessing that value, and check to see if it evenly divides both dimensions. If it doesn't, we can keep decreasing our guess by one until we eventually find a value that works. Since we start from the largest value and go down until we reach the smallest, the first value we find must be the greatest common divisor. Here's that approach written in an imperative programming style. Again, don't focus on the details of the language syntax just yet, What's important is the approach. We're defining a function to compute the greatest common divisor between two values a and b. We start with a guess that's the minimum of the two dimensions. We repeatedly check to see if that guess evenly divides both dimensions. If it doesn't, then we decrease the guess by one. This repeats until we find a guess that does evenly divide both dimensions, at which point we exit the loop and we have our answer. This is imperative programming, using a state variable that we update and a loop. 
But we could also write this same algorithm in a different style, this time using functional programming. Here's the same approach written in a functional style. Inside our function, we're defining a new function called downfrom. The downfrom function takes as its argument a particular guess and checks to see if that guess evenly divides both dimensions. If it does, we return the guess itself, but if it doesn't, we call the downfrom function again on a one smaller guess. So to compute the greatest common divisor between A and B, we just need to call our downfrom function on the minimum of A and B. That's our initial guess, and then the downfrom function will take care of making additional guesses if needed. A few things might stand out to you here. First, though the code is different, it's fundamentally the same algorithm. We keep making smaller guesses until we find a guess that works. But this time, there's no loops, like a for loop or while loop, and there's no changing the state of the computation as by updating variables. Instead, it's just functions calling functions. And importantly, notice that the downfrom function calls itself as part of the body of the function. This is recursion, and it works in this case because each time we recursively call down from, we provide it with a different, smaller input, potentially repeating until we get down to one, which is guaranteed to divide both numbers evenly. But neither of these two solutions is a particularly good way to calculate the greatest common divisor between two numbers. If we wanted to improve our solution, we could look to an approach known as Euclid's algorithm. Euclid's algorithm is based on an insight. Let's go back to our 20 by 28 floor. One thing you might notice is that any tile that could tile this whole floor could also tile a 20 by 20 square floor, since we know the tile size evenly divides the number 20. And if we can use the tile to tile the whole floor, and a 20 by 20 square floor, then it must also be able to tile this remaining 8 by 20 rectangular floor. So the greatest common divisor of 20 and 28 is the same as the greatest common divisor of 8 and 20. And now maybe you see where this algorithm is going. We can repeat the process. What's the greatest common divisor of 8 and 20? Well, to tile an 8 by 20 floor, the tile would also have to tile an 8 by 8 floor, as well as the remaining 8 by 12 floor. To tile an 8 by 12 floor, the tile would have to tile an 8 by 8 floor, as well as the remaining 4 by 8 floor. To tile a 4 by 8 floor, the tile would have to tile a 4 by 4 floor, as well as the remaining 4 by 4 floor. And once we're left with a remaining floor that's a square, in this case, four by four, that could be tiled by a single square tile of size four, and that must be our greatest common divisor. So here's what that algorithm might look like. We're taking the greatest common divisor of A and B. We need to know which one is bigger. So let's assume that A is bigger, or at least as big as B. If that's not true, meaning A is less than B, then we can just call the function again, but with the arguments reversed. So now the first argument will be greater than the second argument. If A and B are equal, that's the square floor case. And we know the greatest common divisor is just A, or equivalently B. But if they're not equal, then we'll call the function again. But this time, take the greatest common divisor of B and A minus B effectively subtracting off that b by b square tile and taking the greatest common divisor of what remains. This function will work, but let's see if we can improve on it further. Right now, if we get down to the case where a is equal to b, what would happen if we didn't immediately return the value a? In that case, we'd arrive at this line and call the function again on b and a minus b. But if a is equal to b, then a minus b is going to be zero. So the function is recursively called with b equal to zero. 
So we could equivalently change this line to say that if b is equal to 0, we return a. The function is still correct. One optimization you might think of is this. If a is much larger than b, we might end up subtracting b, then needing to subtract b again, and again and again repeatedly, until finally the remainder is less than b. So instead of using a minus b, we can instead use the remainder a mod b, take off as many b's as we can, all in one step, so that we're just left with the remainder. And now, let's look at this first line of the function, where we check if a is less than b. What would happen if we didn't include this line? Well, we'd call the function again on b and a mod b. But if a is less than b, a mod b is just a. So we're calling the function on b and a, which is the same thing this first line is doing. As a result, we don't actually need the first line at all. The last line of the function already handles this case for us. And that leaves us with this function, our implementation of Euclid's algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor, which is much more efficient and also much more elegant than the first attempts we made at solving this problem. So what's the lesson here? The key takeaway is that there is more than one way to solve a problem, and some ways are better than others. What does better mean? A program might be better because it's more succinct, more efficient, more readable, more maintainable, more provable, more testable, and ultimately more beautiful. The design of computer programs is all about recognizing that there are many options for solving problems, and identifying which options are better or worse along these dimensions. And that's really what this course is all about, the role of abstraction in the design of software.